Well, welcome everybody. You're all joining. It's uh, it's that time. It's half past two European time, and I'd like to bid you all a warm, warm welcome to this event. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to introduce the event. And I know that there are many people joining us while I'm talking, so I will make sure that uh, we are able to bring everybody fully up to date. Thank you all for joining. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is David Nabarro, and I am one of the people advising on the Food Systems Summit that's being organized by the United Nations Secretary General uh, in the margins of the United Nations General Assembly in September this year. I'm extremely, extremely pleased to say that um, this is a global dialogue. It's the eighth global dialogue as part of the Food Systems Summit preparations. And the subject is empowering cities and local governments to improve food systems globally. This global dialogue is co-convened by Dr. Agnes Calabata, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Food Systems Summit. Also co-convening is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations and the Global Alliance to Improve Nutrition, both of them working on behalf of the Urban Food Systems Working Group. We've also got the Global Task Force of Local and Regional Governance as a co-convener. So this is a dialogue that's got a lot of organizations that bring together groups working in local government as well as in city administrations. And what we're going to be doing is, as you heard, focusing on cities and local governments as jurisdictions within which food systems can be improved. And we're going to focus on their catalytic role in impacting on food systems everywhere. Some housekeeping notes. If you can, please keep your camera turned on. Please make sure your name on uh, your display is the same as the name that you registered with, because that's important when we ask you to go into breakout rooms. Please stay muted unless you're speaking during the discussion group session. Please use the chat box actively. And please remember that the Food Systems Summit dialogues are very much private moments. They're held under Chatham House rules, which means that what you say during the discussion group parts cannot be attributed to you. And indeed, there should be no record kept of what happens in your discussion group. It's meant to be a private and safe space for you. However, during the plenary, of course, we're all on the record. I'd like just to introduce the Food System Summit Dialogues to you. Uh, over the period between 2018 and 2020, my colleagues and I with the strong support of Lawrence Haddad, Gunhild Stordalen, and others, have been developing a method for encouraging systems change through engaging actors within systems in dialogue, but it's a particular kind of structured dialogue that we use. The purpose of the dialogue is to help different stakeholders examine and then appreciate each other's perspectives on challenging issues in food systems. The basic theory is that understanding another person's point of view makes it easier for you to consider shifting your own perspective 
so that you will better align with that of the other. Uh, this approach to what we might call unlocking positions uh, that people have when working within systems through dialogue uh, seems to have been shown to be effective in other areas. But we've, in the context of the Food Systems Summit, taken it really a long way further than we've ever seen it taken before. We encourage multi-stakeholder dialogue with as much diversity as possible among stakeholders. Uh, we encourage diversity within discussion groups and indeed we suggest that that diversity is pre-programmed so as to maximize the likelihood of challenging and indeed uh, mold-breaking conversations. And lastly, we encourage a progression of dialogues in stages. And in the Food Systems Summit uh, for national dialogues, we have an initiation stage, an exploration stage, and a consolidation stage, leading to the production of a pathway that will help take the jurisdiction towards sustainable, equitable, and resilient food systems by 2030. And it's that definition of the pathway and then the coming together in commitments among different stakeholders around the pathway that makes these dialogues particularly special as the basis for encouraging engagement and offering a platform on which systems change can be considered. Right now, in the Food Systems Summit, there are more than a thousand dialogues that have been uh, reported. Uh, in terms of, of happening. Uh, the actual feedback from these dialogues is, is not so fulsome. We've got several hundred feedback forms received, but we're not up at that thousand level. Uh, we've got 137 countries actually undertaking national dialogues. And we have got, as, as I've mentioned, uh, now eight global dialogues have taken place and many hundred independent dialogues synthesis underway to try to pick out the main threads of the dialogue and to present these to the rest of the summit, particularly the action tracks, the levers of change, the science group and others. Now the focus of this dialogue is on urban food systems and trying to mainstream the role of urban and local food systems within the UN Food System Summit pre preparation. And this is relevant to what's happening in the action tracks. Uh, it's re relevant to what's happening in the champions group. It's relevant to what we're hearing from the countries. Now, in order to get us going in this, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Martin Frick, who is the deputy to Dr. Agnes Calabata in her role as the Secretary General Special Envoy for the Food System Summit. Martin Frick is going to give us a five minute opening message. Martin, you have the floor now. David, thank you very much indeed. Um, I have been speaking this morning at um, the National Dialogue of Israel and some of the things that were discussed there really come to mind in um, this dialogue. Um, we have been using the words of a people summit and an action summit for a long time now. But if you really look at what this summit is trying to achieve, then it is talking and implementing food, talking about and implementing food system change on all levels relevant. And this goes indeed from all the way, heads of state and government to local communities, to cities. And it has to be this way because part of the complexity of food systems is that many different decisions on many different levels come together in a reality as it is today, which is not sustainable, which is not just, and is not helping us to come closer to the achievement of the sustainable development goals. But bringing all of these different levels of governance together, brokering the discussions we need between what often happens in silos, preparing the different flying altitudes to use this image of decision-making can really help us bringing forward. Now, I personally come out of the climate process 
And there we have seen how the leadership of cities has pushed the agenda forward, even in very difficult times of the process. And that is also because urban populations are often the most progressive, the best educated populations. They understand the issues and push the agenda forward. And this is particularly true for young people. So if you see what young urban elites are actually talking about these days, what they judge as being a livable, interesting city, a city where you want to settle as a young person, this is exactly the cities that do pay attention to food systems, that have spaces for urban gardening. There are guides out there in which cities you can live and you can produce your own food. And indeed, is there anything more livable than on a Saturday morning to go to a farmer's market and enjoy the particularities and the colors on the flavors that come from the territory that surround um, the cities? So this is a conversation that is most important to our summit. Um, we are here to listen and we are certainly here to weave in your findings into immediately the pre-summit program. And I say it with a hint of nervosity when I think we have four weeks off the pre-summit and I think 14 weeks off the summit. So the block thickens, the energy level is going up and it's fantastic that cities are stepping up to the plate that we will be hearing today from you. Um, exciting initiative and very, very curious to hear from you what your main topics are in this dialogue. And with that, thank you very much. And I guess back to you, David, or back to It you. is absolutely for us to thank you, Martin, once again, for titrating your remarks to fit to the moment. Beautiful. Now, in our dialogue, we usually have a period at the start, which some people call the fire starter period. What happens is that we invite a number of experts to give their perspectives on where we are headed. Uh, I will introduce our panelists uh, one after the other as uh, we reach them. I am going to ask our panelists to stick to four minutes, uh, only so because I want to leave as much time as possible for the conversation. Uh, Jamie Morrison, you're, you're um, in the, the Food and Agriculture Organization as director of the Food Systems and Food Safety Division. And uh, really, I'd love you to comment on the following. There's a glo gro growing global consensus that advancing the agenda of food systems transformation requires active engagement of local authorities in promoting integrated food systems policies and uh, planning. And I'd like to ask you to what extent you agree with that and, and, why, and why now? And in particular, whether you've got any ideas about more effective participation of urban and local governments to ensure integration. Jamie, you have the floor now. Thank you, David. I think you know, I couldn't agree more with the statement. And to try to elaborate why, I'll start with some key facts, which I think are important to bear in mind. Firstly, today, 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas. But more than that, up to 85% live in or within three hours of an urban center of at least 50,000 people. Now, today, we already have 70% of the food which is produced globally, consumed by urban dwellers. And of course, this will only increase as the as urban share of the global population is expected to rise to two thirds by 2050. But I think it's a particular concern that, as of today, over 1 billion people are already living in congested and overcrowding, overcrowded informal urban settings. And here, access to nutritious food is a major challenge for these individuals, um, not only from an economic perspective, because they tend to be poor, um, but also from a physical perspective. As these settlements are often associated with so-called food deserts. Um, you know, areas where access to food is, is difficult and not immediate. And so for these re reasons alone, there's an urgent need to transform urban food systems. Um, but I think 
it's also important to keep in mind that we know that transforming urban food systems can have positive ripple effects across the agri-food system in alleviating issues to do with climate change, waste, energy, and a host of social issues which are key for social development. So as such, we need a comprehensive approach to food system management, um, and this needs food system governance that recognizes the interdependence between the different components of urban food systems and provides a space for cooperation, not just at the city level, but also between the city, the locality in which that city is found, and national level governance of food related issues. Turning to your question of, of why now, um, I think COVID-19 has actually played a, a very catalytic role in turning the call for strengthened urban food systems into practice. During the past 18 months or so, we've seen many city governments playing a very active role in ensuring continued access to safe and nutritious food. And whilst the pandemic continues and will continue for some time to disrupt urban food systems worldwide and will pose a number of challenges for city and, and local governments, um, they have had to deal with, with very rapid changes in food availability, accessibility and affordability each of which are impacting upon food security and nutrition in urban population. Uh, the other component to keep in mind is that the links between urban, local and national food systems are becoming progressively tighter due to dem demographic shifts, urbanization, but also the impact of technology. We've seen a lot of technological changes in the past 18 months, uh, e-commerce being one of those. And it's, it's sort of clear that if we can exploit some of these links, we will go a long way to transforming food systems for the better. Um, but just to, to, to end on, on what we need, I think you know, promoting decentralized, um, decentralization processes and the devolution of responsibilities for planning, financing, managing and supporting economic and social development will be crucial in this respect. But this decentralization needs to go hand in hand with the strengthening of the capacities of local government in mainstreaming food systems thinking into local policy and planning. And I think there are a couple of, of in immediate actions that we can take to support this process. Firstly, urban food system assessments, which include the identification of the main actors, their priorities and their interests. I think this is key. And the reason for this is that at the end of the day, Decisions about the solutions which will be adopted will be political. Um, these will have to resolve many trade-offs and we need good evidence to underpin these, de these decisions. Secondly and finally, integrating food systems into urban and territorial planning requires that food systems governance crosses um, territories. We need solutions that cut across administrative boundaries to promote the food system linkages within and between different levels of government. Thank you very much, David. Oh, Jamie, beautifully said. Uh, these fire starters have to be very, very short, and so I, I will go straight to our next panelist, who is Lawrence Haddad. There is interpretation. Uh, we're going to have presentations in multiple languages. Please use the interpretation button on the bottom, if you like. Now to Lawrence Haddad, who is a, 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 a personal friend of mine. Uh, he's also the executive director of the Global Alliance to Improve Nutrition. He's a winner of the World Food Prize. Uh, he's a uh, former director of the Institute of Development Studies in Sussex, and he chairs Action Track 1 of Food System Summit Preparation. Lawrence, you have the floor now. David, thank you. You're a personal friend of mine too, and a uh, co-winner of that World Food Prize in 2018. So thank you. I'd like to share. I'd like to um, first of all thank Cheryl Pollack and Trevin and Jones and Mika van Rien and of Gain to helping make this this event possible and for and for giving me a good briefing. Um, not that I really needed a briefing because cities have been a big um, 
a big interest of mine since the mid 90s at least when i wrote a paper which went which was met with deafening silence on why there's a big urban food and nutrition security challenge maybe the time is right now 25 years later so david i've got four points in less than four minutes first cities are essential drivers of change so their voices need to be heard they often provide a glimpse into the future they're, they're acknowledged to be the world's engines for business and for innovation so with good management cities can provide better jobs more hope more inclusive growth while building sustainability point one point two despite that cities are misunderstood by those who live outside of them and actually by many people especially the well-off who live within them so if cities do represent the future then the future is certainly unevenly distributed within them for example as jamie said a third of the urban population live in informal settlements and, and slums now that that's one billion out of four so you have these extremes existing side by side rich and poor secure and vulnerable establishment and dissenters and this creates threats and opportunities for the provision of safe nutritious affordable food uh, which is what we're all about in this food system summit so we must understand urban realities better point three but to understand and appreciate these threats and seize the opportunities our mindsets and david is always talking about this and he's so right and you said this in your introdu introduction david our mindsets about cities need to change the ideas that so many of us learned about development need to be revised for cities food environments exposure to information access to services property rights agency all of these things are different in urban settings and they're all extremely dynamic and those differences have to be recognized to help cities to become positive not negative engines for food system change and this is why gain is working so hard with fao the milan urban food policy pact uh, ruaf and others to support and amplify city voice and city agency. Finally, point four, the sphere of control, the sphere of control that cities and local governments have to shape their food systems is perhaps underestimated. It's not recognized enough through mandates or given sufficient budget. Cities and local governments are doing a lot, but there's more that can be done to support and scale up those efforts particularly in the less resourced cities. Again, this is why GAIN is working so hard with the Milan Pact, FAO, RAF and others to develop, we've developed a publication representing over 70 case studies of how cities are shaping their food environments. This will um, uh, go live, we'll launch this as a web platform with these case studies and others, and it should be a good resource for cities. So David, in conclusion, cities are one, a glimpse into the future, two, but we are given a glimpse of a future that is unevenly distributed, that creates threats and opportunities for healthy diets. Three, if we are to manage those threats and seize those opportunities, we have to understand cities better. That means mindset shifts. And in doing so, we will see for why and how we must support cities to help them and the nations they're embedded within to move forward to towards food systems that nourish people, prosperity, and the planet. Thank you, David. Beautiful. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, everybody, it, to encourage mindset shifts, you need thought leaders. And uh, the combination of Lawrence and uh, his colleagues in GAIN is pretty brilliant for that. So, uh, and those four points, uh, everybody, I hope you wrote them down. Uh, you need them, I think, with you as we go into the discussion group session of this dialogue. Et maintenant, je voudrais donner un gros bienvenue à Monsieur Swad Abderrahim. Il est la maire de Tunis, en Tunisie. And uh, just to say to Swad, thank you very much indeed for joining us. I hope that you're hearing, uh, you're hearing us okay. And just to say about Swad, uh, she is the first woman mayor uh, uh, of Tunis and is one of the leaders of Tunisia's decentralization efforts 
as the mayor of the biggest commune in the country. She served as the president of the National Federation of Tunisian Municipalities, a national association that supports and defends the interests of municipalities. And she's a graduate from Monastir School of Pharmacy. Uh, Madame la maire, if that is the correct way of saying it, vous avez la parole. Just checking, uh, Swad Abderrahim, Mayor of Tunis, uh, you have the floor. So, uh, thank you. We will come back to the Mayor of Tunis uh, shortly. Uh, I would like to go to see whether Manuel Alcoletti Lopez de Araujo, mayor of Quelimane in Mozambique. Uh, Manuel, are you here? Bonjour. If so, could you... Ah, Suad, you are here. Please, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you. You have the floor, Madame la Maire. Thank you very much indeed. La connexion est... Merci beaucoup. Mesdames et Messieurs, euh, chers partenaires, cher docteur David Nabarro, je vous remercie tout d'abord énormément pour cette invitation et je tiens à vous remercier de m'avoir invité pour prendre part à cette concertation globale et dédiée au rôle des villes et des autorités locales dans la transformation des systèmes alimentaires dans le monde. Je voudrais aussi saisir cette occasion pour louer l'efficacité de ce processus innovant des concertations globales, indépendantes et nationales, déclenchées en préparation du sommet mondial sur les systèmes alimentaires et la panoplie d'actions qui en ressortent au quotidien. Pour commencer, je voudrais attirer l'attention sur le fait que la réponse à votre question se trouve justement dans l'intitulé que vous avez choisi pour cette concertation. Donner aux villes et aux gouverneurs locaux les moyens pour améliorer le système alimentaire dans le monde. Car, en plus de l'engagement politique des, re, des, re, des responsables locaux, il est nécessaire de mobiliser les moyens adéquats pour assurer cette transformation. Ces moyens sont très divers car ils varient selon que nous considérons le domaine législatif, financier ou technique. Dans cette perspective, il est prioritaire d'avoir tout d'abord le cadre réglementaire et législatif favorable à ce nouveau rôle dont sont dotées les municipalités. Deuxièmement, le renforcement des capacités techniques locales pour se préparer à ce rôle. Autre chose, l'allocation optimale des ressources qui ciblent la promotion des systèmes alimentaires urbains. L'ancrage de ce rôle dans la planification locale en synergie régionale et nationale. L'échange d'expériences entre les villes, échange de savoir-faire, de succès, euh, success story et de bonnes pratiques. Le renforcement des partenariats, partenariats publics privés, partenariats intra-villes, inter-villes, partenariats régionaux et globaux. L'adoption de nouvelles stratégies de mobilisation des ressources qui prend en considération ce nouveau rôle et s'inscrit dans cette nouvelle vision. La mise en place d'un mécanisme de suivi et évaluation pour mesurer les progrès à ajuster les orientations, élargir et continuer le processus de concertation que je trouve une excellente opportunité à toutes les parties prenantes. J'estime que le dialogue indépendant mené par la ville de Tunis le 17 juin dernier, grâce à l'appui de la FAO, de l'ONU Habitat autour de la thématique vers des systèmes alimentaires urbains sains, résilients et inclusifs pour la vie de Tunis et auquel 
ont contribué activement toutes les parties prenantes, à savoir les institutions publiques, les experts spécialisés, les représentants de la société civile, les universitaires aussi, les conseillers municipaux, mais aussi les citoyens, étaient une expérience innovante et une démarche participative en mesure de changer la réalité présente et d'asseoir les bases de systèmes alimentaires inclusifs, durables dans ma vie. Je dois signaler l'intérêt suscité par ce dialogue, ce dialogue et l'implication active dans les débats, et ceci car les citoyens, quelle que soit leur appartenance, savent aujourd'hui que c'est au niveau local que les gens vivent, mangent, consomment de l'eau et se débarrassent de leurs ordures. Et la plupart des défis auxquels sont confrontées les villes, y compris le changement climatique et la sécurité alimentaire, sont de nature globale, mais requièrent des solutions adaptées aux contextes locaux. Ce dialogue, que nous considérons comme une réussite totale, a mis en exercice l'importance primordiale octroyée par les Tunisoises et les Tunisois à des concepts importants tels que la jeunesse, l'innovation, l'inclusivité, la justice, la durabilité, la résilience, la démocratie participative. Des mots clés que nous œuvrons pour concrétiser sur le, sur le terrain des projets concrets. Nous sommes d'autant plus fiers que ce dialogue n'est pas resté à son stade basique, mais nous avons déjà démarré les échanges pour promouvoir l'agriculture urbaine dans un espace vert de la municipalité. Une visite sur terrain a eu lieu jeudi dernier avec des experts et des représentants de l'ONU Habitat pour diagnostiquer un espace vert de la municipalité de Tunis avec l'objectif de mettre à la disposition de jeunes en chômage 20 parcelles qui seront cultivées selon les exigences de la culture biologique avec l'appui et l'encadrement de la municipalité et en organisant des sessions de formation et d'apprentissage continu. Aussi, la municipalité s'engage pour assurer la commercialisation des produits bio de ces parcelles-là en agissant sur les circuits de distribution yeah. et en faisant appel à des plateformes yeah. numériques. À cet égard, j'ai l'expérience de nos amis de Liège avec le beau résultat obtenu dans la ceinture alimentaire liégeoise, un projet de mobilisation des forces vives de la région liégeoise en faveur de développement d'une ville alimentaire courte, écologique et génératrice d'emplois de qualité. Ce premier projet sera d'une importance cruciale car il va concrétiser dans un délai court les recommandations du dialogue, ce qui renforcera la crédibilité de la municipalité. Mais ensemble, nous devrons aller au-delà, notamment en créant des tiers-lieux à vocation environnementale pour la sensibilisation des publics et la mise en avant des solutions sur l'alimentation responsable et le zéro déchet. Sur la sensibilisation à l'économie circulaire, qui est la caractéristique principale de ces pratiques. En effet, j'ai la conviction à l'instar des nouvelles dynamiques de planification urbaine, le tiers-lieu tente de briser les logiques d'usage en silo de la ville en se présentant comme un lieu pluridisciplinaire et d'activités multiples, lieu d'échange et de rencontres informelles gratuits, gratuits d'accès. Le tiers-lieu abolit les frontières entre le domicile et le travail et propose aux usagers de quotidien comme aux curieux de passage à un ensemble de services de proximité oui, oui, oui. pour apprendre, travailler, se reposer, oui. construire, s'alimenter, se, div se divertir de manière responsable et durable. Nous comptons beaucoup sur l'engagement de nos partenaires internationaux pour concrétiser toutes les recommandations de ce dialogue pour que Tunis soit un modèle dans son contexte africain et pour que la réussite du modèle tunisien encourage les autres villes dans cette démarche inclusive et innovante 
qui met l'homme au centre de, de ses politiques. Pour conclure, nous disons que le monde est en urbanisation et euh, ce programme, essentiellement de la FAO, peuvent assurer la sécurité alimentaire et un système alimentaire résilient et durable. Donc, œuvrer pour un écosystème, euh, l'urbanisation durable, la justice sociale, l'intégrité écologique, la résilience face au changement climatique et à l'insécurité alimentaire, des nécessités qui se posent sur la synergie rurale-urbaine. L'inclusion sociale tenant compte de l'approche genre, la durabilité et la présentation des droits à la nature des générations futures et préserver l'avenir. Pour assurer la nutrition et la durabilité des systèmes alimentaires, il faut impliquer les gouverneurs locaux qui sont vraiment des acteurs clés pour faire face aux perturbations telles que la dernière face à euh, celle de la, euh, la pandémie COVID-19. Il faut lutter ce gaspillage alimentaire, les déchets verts qui représentent actuellement 50% des déchets municipaux. Euh, donc là, le problème euh, qui se pose, les résultats Merci. peuvent se trouver chez les responsables locaux. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Madame uh, Mer. Uh, it is excellent that you were able to describe the recent dialogue that took place in your city. I was delighted that in the Tunisian national dialogues there was an independent dialogue organized in partnership, I believe, with the FAO and other parts of the UN. Mm -hmm. Your leadership was brilliant and I am so pleased to hear that you can use the results of this dialogue to ensure a good food future for your city and its people. Beautiful. Thank you. Again, appreciation. I'd like now to move to hear from Manuel Alculete Lopez de Araujo, Mayor of Quelimane, in uh, Mozambique. Man I've asked Manuel if he would, wouldn't mind to offer us some views on uh, the question of how to promote systems thinking and to recognize the interdependency of all stakeholders in food systems. What's happening in your city? Over to you, Mr. Mayor. You have the floor now for four minutes. I shall interrupt after four minutes. Okay, we are going to Quelimane in uh, Mozambique. Uh, connection lost. Okay. This is uh, normal. Uh, I'm super sorry because I really want to hear from you, but uh, we'll come back to you. Let us go to Hugo Bustamente Toscano, who's speaking on behalf of Juan Carlos Quispe, mayor of, of Juan Cayo in Peru. Uh, Hugo, you have the floor now. Four minutes. Muy buenos días, buenos días eh, con todos. I am not uh, speak uh, English, eh, voy a hablar en castellano, pero igual un saludo de parte de toda la provincia de Huancayo que pertenece a la región Junín y al Perú entero. ¿no? El Perú eh, se hace presente en este evento, en este cónclave eh, en el que están presentes representantes de distintos eh, países y nosotros pues tenemos el gusto de poder participar y poder eh, eh, de alguna manera u otra eh, hacernos presente respecto al trabajo que venimos realizando en torno a una alimentación saludable y a los esfuerzos a los esfuerzos que viene realizando eh, la FAO a nivel de nuestro país y sobre todo las experiencias que como provincia venimos desarrollando a fin de que podamos combatir pues eh, 
la anemia, sobre todo dentro de nuestro país. Eh, decirles que como provincia estamos trabajando arduamente para eh, generar espacios de alimentación saludable para de alguna manera u otra combatir un flagelo que uno de los principales problemas a nivel nacional pues es la anemia, ¿no? La anemia que nosotros venimos eh, combatiendo a través de distintas eh, políticas de gobierno, ¿no? Como es, por ejemplo, eh, el trabajo articulado con nuestros eh, agricultores, el trabajo articulado con nuestros productores, evitando cualquier tipo de intermediación y haciendo que ellos eh, puedan no solo generar ingresos económicos, sino también ellos puedan proveer desde sus, eh, eh, desde sus chacras, desde el campo, un eh, producto eh, libre de cualquier pesticida, garantizando una alimentación eh, saludable. Vamos a decirles pues que a nivel de nuestro país estamos eh, trabajando arduamente. Huancayo, eh, al igual que Lima, la capital, es una de las eh, dos ciudades en las que estamos trabajando estrechamente con la FAO eh, a fin de poder de alguna manera u otra pues eh, tener presencia dentro de las políticas que desarrolla el gobierno. Y bueno, decirles también pues que eh, dentro de las actividades que ya nos hemos eh, trazado y estamos, hemos venido desarrollando, durante todas estas últimas semanas hemos trabajado a través... Eh, de estrategias con hermanos del campo, ¿no? Y bueno, vamos a eh, participar y nuestro compromiso es el encargo de nuestro señor alcalde, pues participar a fin de que eh, nuestro municipio, pues que tiene una población cercana a 540 mil eh, habitantes, que es la capital del departamento de Jurín, eh, pues se ubica ¿no? en la parte central del Perú como, como una forma eh, más o menos para ubicarnos de dónde estamos hablando, porque a veces cuando nosotros presentamos al Perú, pocos incluso conocen el Perú, menos aún seguramente conocerán Huancayo, que es la ciudad más importante del centro del, del país. Se construyó una visión dentro del trabajo que venimos haciendo de ser una provincia con cultura alimentaria que utiliza la biodiversidad de forma sostenible para la producción y el consumo de alimentos ecológicos, respetando, por ejemplo, las legislaciones sanitarias, con participación activa de la sociedad. Y en base a esto, eh, se definieron tres ejes eh, importantísimos. La, el primer eje son las políticas de inocuidad alimentaria, eh, el segundo eje es la producción agroecológica, y el tercer eje, las políticas contra la anemia y malnutrición. Esto se ha consolidado en una política municipal eh, con la aprobación de una ordenanza del Consejo Municip Municipal que conforme el Comité del Sistema Alimentario Sostenible y que básicamente en la provincia de Huancayo, el cual pues nosotros lideramos con la participación de diferentes actores en los que Básicamente se articulan acciones orientadas ¿no? sobre la nutrición, la seguridad alimentaria y la alimentación sana y sobre todo balanceada. ¿no? Por ello somos parte, parte ¿no? integrante del Pacto de Milán y la FAO ha sido un aliado estratégico, un aliado clave para la seguridad alimentaria. Asimismo, se ha considerado la conexión con otros territorios con los que existe una vinculación en temas alimentarios promoviendo la conexión con otras provincias. Provincias como, se los menciono básicamente como, eh, como un tema referencial, provincias como Chanchamayo, Satipo, Jauja, Huancabelica y también Lima, que es nuestra, nuestra capital. Esto además ha sido estratégico eh, en el contexto de la emergencia sanitaria, en emergencia nacional eh, y emergencia mundial que vivimos con relación a lo que es el COVID-19, que ha requerido acciones inmediatas para mantener la producción de alimentos de la agricultura familiar, el acceso a los pequeños agricultores y también eh, los pescadores artesanales en los mercados yeah. eh, en los que cumple pues, medidas sanitarias importantísimas. Bien, y bueno, con esta implementación eh, se han implementado en realidad una serie de acciones como la Gracias. inocuidad de alimentos, ¿no? 
eh, antes eh, y durante la pandemia se realizaron acciones de capacitación a los manipuladores de alimentos. En la producción agroecológica también se han implementado ordenanzas municipales que institucionalizan, por ejemplo, una feria de la biodiversidad que curiosamente se ha desarrollado el último sábado. ¿no? El sábado hemos eh, desarrollado pues esta feria a la que ustedes incluso podrían saber cómo ha sido a través de la visita a nuestro fanpage de Hugo, la I want to ask you if you could bring your remarks to a close now. If you could just bring your remarks to a close. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Uh, if you would like to make your concluding remark now, that would be great. Thank you, Hugo. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying it's uh, uh, Hugo Bustamante Toscano. If you would like to bring your remarks to your conclusion now, that would be great. Thank you. I don't think that he understands the, uh, the English. Okay, well, I can't say that in Spanish. So if, uh, I can help you if you like. Could you treat now, please? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Hugo, le está pidiendo que dé una breve conclusión de su presentación. Gracias. Sí, muchas gracias. A manera de conclusión, habría que decirles que como municipalidad estamos comprometidos dentro de la lucha contra la anemia y el trabajo de una alimentación saludable en dos aspectos básicos. Uno, el aspecto normativo, que lo venimos desarrollando a través del Consejo Provincial con la aplicación y aprobación de ordenanzas y normas que nos permitan de alguna manera u otra, alentar el trabajo de nuestros, de nuestros productores y alentar una agricultura exenta de cualquier eh, pesticida o darle fortaleza a ello. Y por otro lado, un trabajo ya eh, de acción, un trabajo ejecutivo, a través de la generación de espacios de desarrollo, por ejemplo, de ferias y festivales donde tenemos como productos bandera a la papa, entre otros, y también el trabajo permanente de fiscalización en los mercados, en los centros de abasto, para la inocuidad alimentaria. Hemos dispuesto ya todo un equipo para que no se dé el trabajo esporádico, sino sea permanente. Es decir, tenemos por un lado el aspecto normativo y por otro lado el aspecto ejecutivo que venimos desarrollando de manera permanente. Muchas gracias. Thank you, what a beautiful account of the uh, way in which things have developed in Huancayo. And in particular, I want to really say how pleased I am that the office of the mayor is creating opportunities for producers and consumers to come together and better understand each other. That's what we need. And that's what can happen in an urban context. Thank you. Uh, if, um, if Manuel Lopez de Araujo is back, could the organizers please tell me? Uh, then I can come to him. But because we're short of time, I'd like to go immediately to Jane Battersby. Now, Jane, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, your associate professor in, uh, 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 in uh, the University of Cape Town. You're an urban geographer and uh, your particular interest is urban food security, urban food systems and food systems governance. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. You have a short presentation. Uh, your four minutes start now. I'm hoping that you're going to tell us a little bit about urban food systems governance and what makes it work well. Great. Thanks, David. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so today I'll be talking very briefly about what opportunities lie for local governments, what kinds of evidence are useful, and I was also asked to give a brief reflection on the role of academia. So no sense of a clear food security mandate or a food system mandate. They believe it's not part of their, their job. 
And this is largely based on historical framings of food security and food systems. However, as these images suggest, many components of the food system take place in urban areas and are under urban jurisdiction. Not only that, but urban consumers and the choices they're able to make are profoundly shaped by issues in the urban economy and urban infrastructure, both of which are core urban functions. So the basis of our research um, has really been to draw attention to the components of the food system that sit within urban space and to reflect what the role of local government is in shaping those systems. So there really needs to be greater attention paid to the realities of the urban food system and why it looks like it does. This means looking at zoning, it means looking at historical planning codes. It re requires reflecting on what kinds of food system activities are being privileged and which are being marginalized through decision making. So we think about things like transport planning, uh, the permitting of traders, the provision of basic water, electricity and other services. And so while many governments assume that they have very little food mandate, they in fact hold immense power in the food system. So, for example, the city of Cape Town has recently done an, an internal audit where they looked at each and every department and what their jobs were that impacted the food system and found a really complex and rich web of overlapping mandates and potential opportunities. One of the big challenges is that there's limited evidence available for decision makers. And this is partly around how we've conceived of food systems in the past. So the ways in which food systems issues and urban issues have been reframed have shaped what kinds of data have been generated and then the kind of data that's available then shapes the, the kind of policy agenda. And the challenge is then that many aspects of the food system are simply not measured or even really seen by the state. So there'll be data, for example, on how many market traders there are who are paying taxes, but not what they're selling or where that food's coming from. So we've been working to try and generate this kind of data to render the food system visible. And I think that the, the, the kind of urban food system assessment that was spoken about earlier is a really vital point in moving this forward. But it's not just about the actual data, it's about how that data is generated. And we really think that there's a need for citizens and all stakeholders to be involved in the generation of evidence and in the analysis. Because if we're going to have policy that works, it needs to involve the end user. And finally, there's a, there's a need for, for, for consideration of, of, of what kinds of data they are. So we know that there's defensible data that policymakers like. It's always the map, it's always the graph. But we also need data that's, or evidence that's going to generate polit um, political will. And oftentimes that's qualitative data, that's narratives. And so we need to come up with different ways of, of getting evidence about the food system. My final point is about the role of academia. Um, it's my belief that academia can play a really vital role in shaping food system transformation at the local scale. Local academics, can build long-term relationships with, with local government and other stakeholders. And these relationships are vital. They not only provide a space for critical debate, but they also serve as important points of institutional memory in systems that change very rapidly. Furthermore, academics can play a role of institutional conscience by holding the state accountable to what it says it's going to do. Not only are local academics rooted, but we're also networked. And we've got to recognize the role that academic networks can play in city to city connections, bringing new ideas and new forms of, of networks and evidence generation to local government. And finally, academics can play an, an important role in bridging that relationship between government, civil society and private sector. We can provide opportunities for safe spaces for divergent interests to come together <clears throat> and for understanding to be developed across systems and sectors where there's often low trust. And that's very common in our cities. So finally, to conclude, I think there are massive opportunities for local government to play an active role in food systems governance, but it depends on a better understanding of the powers of, of local government and a better understanding of the nature of the local food system. That requires better evidence, food specific centric um, data that's generated collaboratively and analyzed and actioned collaboratively. And we think that academics are poised to be at the forefront of this push towards transformative food systems governance. Thank you for your time. Thank you very, very, very much indeed, uh, Jane. Um, I, I just want to say to everybody, uh, just the, the notes that I've written down after that presentation, cities have power, not just in food, but in other crucial areas. Uh, if they're going to be able to exercise that power, they need to understand the issues, understand their powers, and then get working. And we had some very, very valuable pointers there. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to go, if I, uh, uh, 
My plan is to go to our next speaker, Melana Roberts, from the National Food Advisory Council of Canada, where uh, she is chair of Food Secure Canada, which is a national civil society alliance working towards more just, healthy and sustainable food systems. Uh, and just to say that uh, Melana has done a lot of work uh, to address food security in northern and indigenous contexts. Uh, and you, you will hear more when she presents about its significance. After we've heard from Melana, we will go back and see whether or not Manuel from uh, Quelemane is here. Uh, uh, but uh, just we're going to look for him after. So, Melana, you have the floor to tell us a bit about uh, really if there is not a dedicated government department at federal level for food policy, there's not dedicated departments in at local level, but some cities have dedicated food policy teams. And what's in these teams? How do they work? And do they offer us lessons for what should happen at national level? You have the floor now for four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, David. So I think at the heart of the discussion on how we think about, you know, vertically integrated food systems, um, you know, is really the question of how do we tackle silos? So I think it's important, um, you know, in response to your question to think about silos between different levels of government um, at urban levels uh, and at national levels, but also how do food system actors uh, interact with uh, government more broadly? And I think this is a question we really were posed with in 2019 in Canada with the creation of the first ever national food policy. And I think this was something where we saw civil society actors come together and really drive uh, towards the creation of a Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council. Now this body, uh, at which I'm a member as you heard, uh, is quite diverse. It has 22 members who really uh, run the gamut of the food system. People who are working on issues as diverse as uh, student nutrition to local procurement uh, to uh, work around supply chain and even labor. And I think what's particularly important about this body that can teach us about, you know, food system teams municipally and even to reflect on uh, how to advance an urban food systems agenda is the idea of bringing together diverse actors across the food system who have interests that are varied and really bring bring perspectives that are uh, grounded in the local reality and context that might be differing uh, across the country. And I think what's particularly important about this is it strengthens the opportunity for these perspectives at the decision-making table while also strengthening uh, feedback loops. So we have these diverse actors actually being able to engage their own networks and actually open up transparency of what the decision-making process look like. What are the decisions and issues at the table to start to break open in what often is a closed door process when we're thinking about governance. And I think this is important because this really strengthens and expands networks, increases policy coherence across different levels, uh, whether that be municipally, uh, in our case in Canada provincially and, and nationally, but also ensures that locally informed experiences actually drive national policy agenda, which is critical. Now, uh, this uh, Food Policy Council was only launched in 2021, so earlier this year, but I think my experience as a member of the Toronto Food Policy Council, a council that is more than 30 years old um, and really does represent a diversity of perspectives across the food system uh, from people who are working as chefs, people who are working on food security programs, nutritionists, academics, um, people who are really uh, engaged on the front line to inform decisions across diverse city departments who in many cases don't feel like they have a mandate around food but are kind of brought in to think about how do we bring the food lens to the work that you're doing? And so I want to share kind of three key perspectives that I think make mechanisms like food policy uh, councils effective and can really help us understand uh, how to uh, really bridge the gap across different levels of government, across different stakeholders to think about how to build stronger, more local and responsive uh, urban food agendas. So the first I would really highlight is this idea that uh, food governance is really about advancing equity, and we all have a role to play across the sphere. Um, and so I think this is important just to, to really simplify 
uh, all of our thinking in this conversation to remember that when we're thinking about advancing the food system, I think we're ultimately thinking about how do we improve the experience of the everyday person and how they access food and how they participate in decision making. And I think in doing so, it really forces us to come to the question of what are the challenges in that and how do we increase equity so we all have a better role to play so that the food system is more responsive to our needs. I think when we bring this lens to it, we also recognize there's a greater opportunity for the food system and action within it to advance a social protection agenda and increase inclusion and equity more broadly. And I think that that recognition really does help us uh, think across what are the particular roles that each jurisdiction might play at different levels of government and to weave in a need for a more integrated agenda and approach to really drive greater coherence. The second element I would recommend to really consider in this conversation for success is the idea that there's no better place to drive equity than in our cities. And I think we heard Lawrence and Dad speak about this. Cities are often really misunderstood, but I think they really do open up a window for, uh, for change and impact for a variety of reasons. And I would actually say it's because of the diversity within cities that they present the strongest opportunity. So I will give the city of Toronto where I live as an example. You know, we have 250 ethnicities, 170 languages in a very small area. Um, and at the same time, with all of this diversity and, and you know, you've heard about investment and progressive ideas, this is also often the area where we see the greatest poverty, the greatest levels of food insecurity. And so by having a more targeted approach on these areas where we have the confluence of these challenges and opportunities, we have the greatest opportunity for impact. And really focusing on groups who've been underserved and most challenged not only presents an opportunity for the greatest impact when thinking about an agenda around advancing food systems, but I think it also presents an opportunity as well when thinking about how do we start to build a greater coherence across different perspectives, address greater needs of a diversity of populations and have voices at the table. And last and not least, I would really highlight the idea that governments cannot do this alone. The idea that uh, in order to recalibrate and strengthen the food system, we really need to have more people at the table. And I think food policy advisory councils, uh, food policy councils more generally, create a framework to understand this. But what I would really underscore that if we are trying to, to tackle the food system, I would say, is really an act in thinking about how do we tackle systemic injustices. So governments cannot do this alone. And we really need to position uh, underserved and dis most disenfranchised populations, and in Canada that's often Indigenous peoples and often uh, you know, Black populations in Canada as well, to be resourced to be able to not only participate but actually sit at decision-making tables. And in doing so, I think we're really opening the door not only for dialogue but actually for an opportunity for shared leadership to build more mechanisms to fill those gaps in where we need a greater response and to understand what we need. And I think what this will also do is increase trust yeah. and leadership and accountability, which will allow for greater alignment and co cohesion yeah. across difference. So I think this is really how we're going to be driving uh, stronger food systems and advancing an agenda. I love it. Equity at the middle, because inequity is just awful. That's what's the underlying misery. People who are really poor have a totally different food experience from people like me. Secondly, social protection, because there are people who just miss out. And the role of governance is to, is to catch them and help them. And then make it happen in cities, because cities is the right place. Thank you for your leadership, Milana, and what you've done over the years and for joining us today. Now, I want to just give everybody a chance to understand just one thing, which is a very tiny bit about this group that are behind things here. And, uh, and I'd like to get uh, messages from the Urban Food Systems Working Group. But I'm running terribly late. I'm going to ask Peter DeFranceschi if you can possibly give your messages in one tenth of the time that you were planning to, please don't give a long PowerPoint. We just don't have time. And this is a dialogue and the purpose is to get people themselves to talk. So if I could ask you, Peter, please don't show a PowerPoint. Please just give your messages and help us get on with the dialogue. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's a difficult one. And, this uh, is a dialogue, it's not a lecture moment. And yeah. I had said to people, 
please don't show PowerPoints if you can possibly help it. Thank you. Okay. I'll try to do my best. Oh, it's a dialogue. All you've got to do is to prepare people for a dialogue. This is to let other people share their thoughts. Uh, really, it's, and, and they can then, I can bring you in at the end and you can comment on what they've said. Please. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, first of all, to meet the, the godfather of the independent dialogue scheme, which has really worked well in our case. When I say we, I speak on behalf of, uh, with one voice, of a one common roadmap of the Urban Food System Working Group, which is 26 members of the leading city networks, several UN agencies, with FAO as a coordinating role, and several other organizations and academic institutions, as well as cities. Over the past months, we developed and hold 26 independent dialogues in 26 cities, most of them in Africa, from Tunis down to Cape Town and many other cities. And we had consultations with the 52 cities on solution clusters and on, on action areas. Key messages were, and I'm glad you mentioned that already, equity and inclusion. This was indeed a key aspect, for instance, in one independent dialogue that we hold in with the US cities and Canadian communities about the ensuring food security and good, good nutrition for all in providing access to healthy, affordable, and cultural appropriate food. And one sentence that got stuck in my head from a one community leader was, they don't see us. There was enough said about systemic and multi-level, but I can just reiterate it once more that cities and uh, towns where most of us humans live and more than 70% of food is consumed, those local governments cannot manage it alone. They cannot manage emergency response alone. They cannot tackle childhood obesity alone, nor food poverty or food deserts. There are many things they can do, and Jane mentioned a few, but this, there will be a need for a proper vertical integration and a multi-level governance. And this also asks for cross-cutting financing mechanisms in order to have a transformative infrastructure. Another important message is the integrated local food planning. It's really important and all good practice examples show across departmental systemic collaboration in order to integrate food systems in urban and territorial planning and governance. Everywhere, the good practices show the importance of including communities, participatory approaches, and proximity food economy. It really needs a collaborative engagement and a multi-stakeholder multi engagement and food policy councils are not just cosmetics, they need to be taken on board and seriously also by the food governance. School feeding was another important message and I'm happy to hear that there are good chances that this is taken up that every child who goes to school has a healthy meal because a child cannot learn and grow properly with an empty stomach. Afterwards, another important message about healthy food environments, also this was addressed, there is a need of data, of spatial information, of clearer insights also for local governments on what behavioral sciences are needed and resources in order to, to move towards a more resilient and healthy food systems. And local fresh food markets are a crucial entry point here. Finally, food waste, our big shame, which is a lose-lose situation in terms of lost energy, lost economy, poverty, and greenhouse gas emissions. And there in one independent dialogue, I was shocked to hear that of the, in this major city of the 3,000 farmers around that produce fresh fruits and vegetables, 57% of the, those fruits and vegetables would perish on the way before being consumed. So there is really a need to address infrastructure, storage, cooling, composting in order to reduce food waste and to have a global commitment to phase out food waste disposal from both landfill and incineration would radically transform the relationship between cities and uh, towns. And finally, the last point, emergency planning response and recovery. We know the question is not on emergency, it's not if, but when. We've seen it with the pandemic, we know it with climate. So when emergencies happen, it, the citizens don't go to the president, they go to the local government and they have to react in real time. And there is a need to professionalize and equip those 
who have to do emergency fruit planning. And there is a need for multi-level resilience planning for emergency response. And let me conclude with a sentence, the road to sustainable and healthy food systems leads through the cities and towns of our planet. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thanks very much indeed. That was lovely. And thanks for all the dialogues that you've done and for the leadership of, uh, of um, ICLEI, which is such an important organization. Uh, and thank you for your last point, which is uh, really the city is the key place where everything comes together. And let's see if we can just hear from Manuel Alcolete Lopez de Araujo, the mayor of Quella, Quelimani in Mozambique. Uh, very briefly, Manuel, because we've lost so much time, just if you could give us a couple of minutes of your view on how best to get the city to take the leadership on moving towards sustainable and equitable food systems. That would be absolutely brilliant. Manuel, you have the floor now. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Uh, first of all, as my, my colleagues have been mentioning here, the number one priority in our view is to have a clear vision of where the city wants to move from and where to. So the issue of leadership from the local government and uh, the mayor or the team that is responsible needs really to set up a clear pathway from where the city is and where the city wants to go. And the, the second point is then having identified where, what are the, the targets that the city wants to reach. It's very important to set a clear path of policies that the city agreed to implement. That path of policies need then to be communicated clearly to all the involved stakeholders. It's very important to have a set of identified stakeholders committed with the objectives that uh, were identified so that then they could move as a team together. And those stakeholders can be business, the business sector, farmers, vendors, and all who are interested in achieving that objective. The third is to have a communication strategy that everybody or all the stakeholders do understand. So by implementing a clear vision by clarifying the mission and the objectives as well as the targets, then by developing a strategy very clearly and having a communication pathway, I think that then it, it is guaranteed that the city can achieve the main objectives of the policies and also of the action that are set up. Thank you. Manuel, I love it. I love your English. Thank you. Uh, I'll tell you why. I think you were whispering to me in my sleep a year ago, because when we developed the approach for the national dialogues in the Food Systems Summit, we said, we need to be clear on where we wish to be by 2030. We need a vision. We need to be working out how we're going to get to that vision and for that we need a pathway and thirdly we need to make sure we bring everybody together so they contribute towards it. Manuel thank you and thank, thank you, you for taking you. all the trouble to join us with your wisdom uh, and uh, if you can stick around that's great we'll try to bring you back later. Thank you. you thank hear you very much. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado. De thank you. De nada. Thank you. Now uh, we're going to have a discussion session stimulated by these fire starters and just think back to all the lovely things that each one of them said. And then in your discussion groups, it's about 12 per persons in each group, you're given a topic related to food systems that's focusing on where the food systems ought to be by 2030. You'll have a facilitator in each group. 
And that facilitator ensures that everybody has a chance to participate. Also, we'll give a short report back. And I'm going to ask for super short. I want the feelings of the facilitators when they report back at the end. Not a list of everything you decided. You all are experts. It's more the feelings of whether you can get a shift on urban food systems and, and if so, how. Thirdly, uh, I, I, when, you, when you're in your groups, listen to each other. Try to understand each other's point of view. Find new friends and connect to them. Don't worry if you don't like the person, still connect to them. Look for synergy, but also look for divergence. And then think how to work together for promising action. And then think through potential impact. But remember, this is a global dialogue. And everything you say here will have significance for the summit. Uh, because we know uh, that cities are such an important venue for action. Uh, many of you have been doing this. Many of you are active in the national dialogues through stimulating city dialogues. Just get it out in the open. Let's have it clear. So each of your discussion topics is a vision of 2030. There are six themes altogether. The first theme is about integrating food systems transformation into urban and territorial governance. You think back to what Peter said, he was very, very keen on this, right, on this. And, and I think we, we need to all the time have the ICLEI uh, recommendations in the backs of our minds. The second theme, promoting sustainable urban food systems through public procurement and school meals. Super important. Many of you are working on it. I know some of you who come in because I saw your names in the waiting room. You've been particularly involved in this. Third theme urban and local actions for sustainable food systems, looking at food environments, urban food waste reduction, and circular economy. Well, you heard about that in, in our testimonials from different uh, urban teams around the world, but particularly from in, um, from in Kualimane in, Mo in, in, in Mozambique and also Juan Cayo in Peru. This came up. Fourth, Financing mechanisms for sustainable urban food system solutions. Super, super relevant. Fifth, leveraging urban and local food systems to strengthen social protection and inclusion through school food and nutrition programs. You heard our mayor of Tunis talk about this, Suad Abderrahim. And so let's build on what we learned from her. And then six building the resilience of urban food systems to shocks and stresses through local national action. Again, Peter, in his presentation, stressed in his last point how important this is. So your discussions directly build on what we've heard. Now, we're late, but that's not infrequent. So I'm going to ask you to do your discussion a bit on speed to try to get it done fast. And, and you have just over 50 minutes for your discussions. Uh, I will invite the facilitators to make certain that you try to get towards conclusions in 55 minutes rather than in the previously scheduled one hour, 10 minutes. We've lost 15 minutes. My fault, bad timekeeping. So with that, I'm going to invite the team to distribute you to your rooms have an enormous amount of fun, make friends that you've never made before, have unusual connections, but most important, get this right. Okay, over to you, off we go. After some absolutely amazing, amazing discussions in the breakout rooms, I was very lucky, I was able to move from room to room. And uh, I, I mean, what I've learned in dialogues is that when you get really intense exchanges, meaningful exchanges between people, uh, then uh, really that leads to uh, an opportunity to unlock some of the previous perspectives and help people shift. And you can move super fast when everybody's in the right mood to work together. And I get the feeling that in some of the cities represented here, they're not just in the right mood, they're working together 
and getting amazing things to happen. In the report back in these dialogues, we like to invite the facilitators to reflect on their feelings as they listen to the discussion. Please don't give us a list of what you discussed. Uh, that The note takers will help us capture that in the written report. But for now, let's get the feelings. How does it feel for all of you? And then let's build up over the next 40 minutes, absolute maximum. And we're going to be short, short in time as always. But let's build up a, a kaleidoscope of our feelings and help us be positioned for the cities being the frontier of advancing transformation on food systems. Cities at the frontier. I want to go through in numerical order for feedback. So start, unless there's any problem with this, please send me a text message, uh, a chat message if there is. But I want to go in sequential order and I want to start with 1.1, the first theme, and that is Roberta Sonnina. I'm going to be quite tough, cut off at three minutes, and it will be cut off. And lastly, uh, please tell us what it was your group was discussing. Roberto, you have the floor now. Thank you, thank you, David. So uh, the feeling was very vibrant. It was an excellent, vibrant discussion with uh, a general consensus over the obstacles to territorial integrated uh, planning and food system transformation at the urban level, but also lots of ideas about measures, practical things that could be done to ensure that cities realize their full potential. I'll just mention in random order, amongst the obstacles, um, the language was very uh, intriguing, I found. The people talk about food being invisible for too long. They talk about inability of, uh, by, by some policymakers to understand the food as a system. We need a common understanding and there's a very strong uh, hope that the Food System Summit will contribute to create this understanding of what it means to address food as a system to deliver food system transformation on the ground. Um, on the um, me mechanisms and potential solutions to the problems identified in the discussion, one strong plea coming out of this discussion, please let's do something to mobilize national governments uh, to get them on board, to come up with policies that create an enabling environment for local governments because there are limits to what they can do on their own. For example, we want to avoid replicating the tendency towards binary thinking, urban versus rural. Territorial integrated governance is about bringing together urban and rural, bringing together cities and town of different sizes, we need national governments on board in terms of investment, for example. So uh, we discuss, for example, the possibility of redirecting some of the agricultural uh, funding to cities or leveraging the point that the power of public procurement uh, to try and support and build capacity, administrative and financial capacity at the urban level. Uh, so key message, we need to strengthen both horizontal and vertical governance. So we need cities to find representation on global bodies. We need to enhance participation and build capacity and think long term. And that's all from me, David. Many thanks. Perfect, perfect. Bang on time. Thank you. And uh, everybody, just when, when you're hearing the presentations, please very much think through what was it that you had from that facilitator that really struck you and what i'm going to hold hold on to is get the governments on board it's no good if the cities are far out in the front of the national governments thank you roberta wonderful let's go now to group one stop two also looking at vision by 2030 barbara emmanuel recently uh, retired from Toronto, 
uh, food strategy. You have the floor, Barbara. Okay. Uh, we had a wonderful discussion in our group. Um, I'm going to take it seriously to try to uh, capture the passion and the energy around the group. Uh, and if we have time, get more to the notes. Um, so one of the things that was uh, remarked and was actually uh, presented on the panel, but uh, embedding an integrated approach uh, is a long-term agenda um, and therefore a long-term commitment. <clears throat> but it's important to mobilize the passion, the tenacity, the champions on the ground um, <clears throat> that exists. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's important, it was noted uh, with uh, a great deal of passion, I must say, uh, that the whole city needs to be mobilized uh, and thereby uh, um, facilitate a number of different champions, both inside the local government, but also in the community and civil society to allow uh, us to be nimble and opportunistic and take advantage of the energy that's already there. Um, some cities uh, are uh, really far ahead in this uh, regard and in fact are further ahead than national governments. And the reverse is the case in other jurisdictions where national government has a very strong food agenda. So joining up the national, regional, and uh, local government response takes this long-term energy. Uh, we uh, acknowledged that uh, we have an opportunity now, certainly in the context of the pandemic, to harness that energy and the relationships that have come out of it. But building on the uh, stakeholder management mapping, the analysis, the data collection, uh, always uh, keeping uh, in mind uh, an equity and inclusive approach so that uh, all stakeholders have a voice uh, in this. Um, and uh, the, the role of uh, research and uh, academia, as uh, Jane Battersby had said in the panel, is really important to support these efforts and to broker some of these relationships. But we need uh, those champions. We need those champions to have the uh, information, the research at their fingertips um, and to bring others along for cities to share information, mentor each other, support each other for regional cities, wherever that's possible, to come together uh, because they have similar territorial pressures uh, and opportunities um, and they can make a uh, great impact, but also to bring others along. Um, so, sorry, I didn't even get to the, the content, but here we are. But thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us such a lovely summary of what you believe really matters. and building on the experience of your group and your own personal experience from uh, uh, Toronto, um, the champions matter. Everybody, the champions matter. Without the champion, you can't do it. And uh, also remember the key role of academia, make sure all stakeholders have their voice. Thanks again to your group. Raphael uh, Zavala, I just want to check, were you the facilitator of your group? When I went into it, I couldn't find you, but I was a bit late. Or is somebody else going to report on your group? No, no, yeah. I, was, I, I was there indeed, but in Spanish. Okay, I want you to speak in Spanish, but you only get three minutes, even though you're speaking in Spanish. Off you go now. Gracias. Uh, th thank you, David. En, uh, nuestro grupo fue un grupo multiactoral. ¿sí? Había instituciones de sociedad civil, académicas, de gobierno y de cooperación internacional. Se eh, resumió en la necesidad de las cuatro I's. La primera I es de información, información a través de plataformas, de todos los multiactores presentes en el sistema alimentario, 
y esa, eh, esa plataforma va a servir para dirimir eh, conflictos. Otra información es muy importante en la generación de los consejos locales eh, de participación ciudadana para que haya o, mecanismos de transparencia y diálogo aplicados en lo local. Otra I, además de información, es la I de inclusión. Inclusión desde tres tipos, inclusión eh, social del ciudadano en la participación de esquemas de gobernanza, pero sobre todo también inclusión económica, particularmente de, eh, la, de la pequeña agricultura, de la agricultura familiar por medio de compras, de, de compras públicas para los programas de alimentación, ya sea alimentación escolar u otros compromisos del gobierno. Y otra inclusión que es muy importante y una lección de la pandemia es la inclusión digital. ¿eh? Tenemos que luchar por eliminar la exclusión digital que es muy predominante en las zonas rurales de Latinoamérica. Vamos con las otras dos Is. Además de información de inclusión, está la necesidad de generar instituciones, institucionalidad, en donde participen las entidades menos, eh, eh, menos variables, que son universidades, centros de investigación, que sean los que inviten a, a generar estos espacios, esta nueva institucionalidad de sistemas alimentarios, en donde se generen marcos de muy relacionado con la institucionalidad, con marcos institucionales y legales para mecanismos de transparencia que disminuyan eh, cualquier espacio para la corrupción en todo lo que tenga que ver con compras de alimentos y la generación de estrategias alimentarias. Y es todo un desafío para llegar al 2030 con, con una nueva institucionalidad de los sistemas alimentarios. La última ahí, la integración sobre todo en muchos de, los, de nuestros países en donde todavía no son sistemas, sino cadenas. En la medida en que sigan siendo cadenas, no vamos a poder generar un abordaje de sistema alimentario sostenible en grandes, pequeñas o medianas ciudades. Es sumamente importante también la integración de los alimentos saludables, siempre que se pueda, en la, si se pueden alimentos orgánicos, etcétera, es todo un desafío ante alimentar masas, pero siempre que se pueda en ciudades pequeñas y medianas, generar la, la integración de eh, la agricultura saludable de los pequeños productores. Adelante. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, indeed, Rafael. I, I, I have to say, there was one thing you said, that I thought was very important. Working on value chains does not help us. Gosh, I wish more people understood that. Uh, if you want to really help people in cities get their heads around food, if you just focus on value chains, uh, it, it, it doesn't actually help the people. It helps those who have an interest in the commodities. So by talking about the totality of the food experience rather than individual value chains, I think uh, you have a very good chance. That was a beautiful presentation from your group. Lovely, all of you, all of you in group one, uh, theme one, focusing on integrating into urban and territorial governance have given us some very rich pointers. Now let's go to theme two, which is promoting sustainable food systems through public procurement and school meals. Bettina bergman madsen from Copenhagen, you have the floor. It is three minutes. It starts now. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be given the floor. And uh, it was a very good discussion we had in the group. Uh, it was actually so good that uh, we, we didn't let David speak when he was there. So sorry for that one. But... Um, and if we had a good feeling and, and, and we didn't disagree on that school feeding is very, very important for all of us. Um, so we could agree on that one. And of course, it's a very hard thing to do. How can we make sure that everybody thinks about school feeding? But why is it important? We agreed on that it's important because it also gives us the possibility to give children a, a healthy meal during the day and also give them the connection of understanding healthy food what is healthy food 
So it's not just feeding, it's not just a meal that they need to, to be served, it's also a meal that needs to be healthy and that needs to, to give them the understanding about food, also local food in, in our community. What is important in our own community? Because of course we eat something different in Denmark than we do in Africa, uh, because we grow different things in, in, in different uh, seasons. So this is some of the things we agreed on, but everybody should be able to uh, look at this uh, as a possibility to give the future generation something to be have a better understanding about the food system. So one of the things we said this this does not come by itself. Uh, even though if we agree on uh, serving school meals, it needs to be supported by the public procurement and the public procurement should be a sustainable procurement. So it's important that we put it underneath this umbrella saying that we all have the sustainable development goals. And even though we are in different uh, settings, we can still use the same um, uh, terminology on, on how to incorporate different uh, goals into our procurement. Uh, it can be uh, supporting uh, small and medium-sized firms from the local area. We can do that all over the world. We should do that even more. And it can also be how to procure for more fairly traded food or sustainable palm oil, or you mentioned it, everything can be included if you just uh, think your way about it. And then we also talked about maybe creating like a joint community or communication towards children and parents about healthy food uh, and school meals. One of the things that I was uh, excited about is actually now uh, all the pieces of the puzzle begins to, to fit together, for me at least, uh, talking about it with many different um, of these action tracks and sub areas because it's not my area, but actually now we, we see the puzzles beginning to fit together and we just hope that the discussion at the pre-summit will be also around school meals because it is one of the keys that could actually change the food system in the future. So I, I think that was uh, some of the reporting back uh, from us. Um, it was short, <laughs> so we saved some. But thank you, you've given me some more time. And I have to tell you, there is a huge interest in uh, children's health and nutrition through engaging with them in schools, of which school meals is a part, but it's trying to access food locally rather than importing it. So it's homegrown school meals and uh, really using it, as you've implied, as a space within which a lot of other pieces can come in and uh, and uh, you just described it perfectly. Thank you uh, for that uh, presentation, Bettina. And thank you for a brilliant group. Let's now go to theme three, urban and local actions for sustainable food systems, food environments, urban food waste reductions, and circular economy. We've got two groups. We'll start with Juliana Tangari. Three minutes, please. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. And our group had this vivid and lovely conversation on uh, the local the, the 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 role of local authorities uh, and the local government on shaping food environments and reduction food waste and enabling circular economy. And we talked a lot about uh, challenges. Um, so how infrastructures should be uh, improved, uh, transportation, distribution systems, um, civil society participation, consumers' role, um, uh, low-cost technology, um, academy and government partnerships, um, school meals, um, informality, um, lack, of lack of data, lack of information. But at the end, I think the key message here when listening uh, to the, the challenges and what the action should be uh, was uh, mainly um, have local policies, local food strategies with real food systems approach. And it seemed to me that uh, putting food systems approach uh, uh, in all conversation and in understanding that Food should be uh, 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 centered in all policies, in local, in all local policies. Uh, make the, the 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 would make the the, the real difference. So um, regarding the actions, going to the real uh, uh, actions that we need to to engage right now, um, I would uh, highlight um, acting collectively. So collective uh, action 
Um, going back to basics and planning, um, infrastructure, transportation, data collection, um, and regulation. Um, engaging uh, consumers, public engagement is key to the, to the uh, solutions we need to, to, to address. Um, the informal market, how we address informality, how we collect data and put informal market actors in the center. Um, um, enabling forums for civil society participation. Um, stronger uh, food uh, education, food and nutrition education for uh, a, a, a major and stronger role of consumers. Um, and uh, at the end, the, the discussion can be uh, um, resumed in um, putting diversity into the, the, the center of the table. The, the, the main key is uh, think about the whole food system uh, with the, the diversity and, and diversity in what we eat in the solutions we have to, to address, in the innovations we need. And that's why local governments, local, uh, the local level, the cities are the, the forum for all of that, because that's where diversity can rise. Thank you, David. Thank you. Brilliant. Everybody. That was done so well. And you know you did it in exactly 2.8 uh, minutes. Beautiful. And um, look, everybody, you're hearing it now. Everybody needs to be there. And you need the digital for them to be connected. We're hearing that again and again. I like it when we do these feedbacks. You pick up strands going through them all. Thank you, uh, Juliana from Comida da Amania. And let's go to Zachary Tofias from C40. Same issue, separate group. Show how you built on or differed from what you heard from Juliana, please. Absolutely. And, and it's wonderful that Juliana started because it was a very complimentary conversation and with the other groups as well. So I think that we, we also had a very enthusiastic group uh, that had a ton of great solutions. Um, and I think that putting food at the center and putting people at the center of these conversations was that real consistent theme. So I won't repeat what Juliana said because there were so many overlaps. But the few things that I wanted to pull out specifically, the importance of data that a lot of cities don't know what consumption is and what waste is. So we need to make the case by showing what actual, actually is happening. So data, the importance of data, the importance of pilot projects, making that case, giving cities the tools to show and do more, but getting fast results um, so they can get more of that political buy-in. We talked about increasing budgets, the opportunities of giving those city officials the tools to do all this great work but also the opportunity to make the case up to the national government and, and vice versa. Uh, we talked quite a bit about the power of policies. So the power of policies, that, that, that real opportunity of city governments to, to regulate. And one of the, the, the key themes, and I'm not being exhaustive, um, but one of the key themes that we talked about was banning food waste from ending up in landfill. So uh, the opportunities to support organic waste and composting at the household level through organic farming. Another really interesting thing that I think we've, a thread that I'd love uh, to really highlight is the opportunity of youth. We've heard a lot about youth, um, but our group talked quite a bit about campaigns and education and engagement, really of the, that younger generation that is empowered and is so motivated and opinionated about these food systems issues. So governments in particular, and their importance and impact on uh, educational institutions in terms of the foods that serve, but also in terms of how waste is managed, but also how students are educated. So I'll, I'll pause there to give some of my time back to David to summarize and make me sound even better than what I said. So, Gary Zachary, you are, of course, brilliant. Do you know what the thing that I really want to highlight? You said put food at the center, put people at the center. How often when we talk about food, does the conversation turn into a discussion about people? Not often enough. It's not just about food, it's about the people. So you said that, Zachary. Uh, you said it's an opportunity for younger people, I was going to say, and older people, being an old man. It's the people either end, the young and the old, they've both got good stuff to offer. Everybody in the middle is a bit busy. Thank you to Zachary and team. Moving on. 
No time to lose. David Jackson is going to report back on financing mechanisms for sustainable urban food solutions. David, you have the floor. Three minutes. David. David Jackson. Can you hear me? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Perfect. There Wait, you are. No. microphone was mute. Yeah, sorry. So firstly, you asked me to speak about feelings. So I think I felt optimistic, happy, and with a great sense of discovery following our group. We had uh, somebody speaking from the, the, the seaside in Jubaland, Somalia, and we had people speaking from Peru. So it was a wide geographical spectrum. And we looked at uh, financing mechanisms, the business models. And we agreed, I think, with your point, it's not about the value chain of a commercialized uh, financing mechanism. There have to be other financing mechanisms that are sustainable in the public or private sector. The money can keep on coming. But how do you create those? And what instruments do cities have at their disposal? We looked at the tax. We looked at the real estate. We looked at the regulation. We looked at the possibility of equity investment. We looked at subsidies. We looked at guarantees. We looked at PPPs. We looked at co-ops. All of these are tools that cities have in their toolbox. And what we discovered was there's opportunity to deploy these tools in ways which perhaps we hadn't really thought about before that can make a big difference in terms of the food and nutritional uh, issue. One uh, example that came up was the whole way of, 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 of trying to find ways to organize into co-ops, et cetera, the informal food sellers that are often chased away, but how that, then, that, that can then be connected to the real estate angle, to the tax angle, to find ways to avoid um, uh, way, food going into waste. Uh, uh, other examples, of course, is using the real estate for the markets the, 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 on the PPPs, where you can organize what you're, what you're buying and what you're selling. Um, we came up with a whole variety of, of ways of using these tools. But why I felt so happy is that we defined the tools in financial terms. Those tools I listed at the beginning are things that city managers, city budget officers, local economic development officers, they are things that they know about. They may not be part of the food network, but they are part of the public finance, the private finance network. And where I felt optimistic following our group, speaking as somebody coming from the finance uh, network, is I now see the points of linkages, which is not just talking about value chains, et cetera, et cetera, but instead is talking about putting cities at the forefront of making those linkages and integrating the nutritional uh, angle into the city angle uh, as we've been discussing in the plenary session so for me it was an incredible voyage of discovery and i now start to see things in a different way than before linking the finance with the food people and cities at the focus not value chains at the focus thank you kind of summary as a moderator that i love uh, just to pick up, uh, as well as it's not about the value chain, uh, another one that came from this group was, we've got tools in the toolbox. They're not the food tools, they're the money tools. Let's use them unusually, let's value them. And so you have to roam around to find them, but clearly there is money available, and David and group uh, really made that point. Thank you, David. Nice presentation. We're going now to... Luta uh, Swami from the city of New Haven, who was facilitating a group working on how to leverage urban and local food systems to strengthen social protection and inclusion. Tricky, tricky for you. How did it go? You have three minutes starting now. Yes, thanks everyone. So we had a great discussion where we actually reviewed several specific examples that gave us some shared actionable recommendations. And I hope to reflect some of the examples shared via the three themes that really stood out for me. These three themes are going back to the basics, really. How do we truly co-design programs and policies? How do we meet people where they are at? And how do we ensure those who are historically and currently oppressed are the principal actors? So I want to highlight a few examples that came out in these three themes. So for example, in co-designing programs and policies, 
we want to ensure that we are working with a variety of stakeholders and through many disciplinary lenses. Again, this is going back to basics. This is nothing that none of us have not ever heard before. So when we think about stakeholder engagement, we have to think broadly. For example, using school meals, we need to think about children are stakeholders. We need to talk to them. Parents are stakeholders. People implementing the programs like the food service workers, they are stakeholders, not just NGOs working in this space, not just government officials. Also, when we think about transforming school meals and procurement, we have to think through disciplinary lenses beyond just providing food. So thinking about nutrition, supply chain, things like that. Another example, thinking about designing uh, climate forward policies that may be related to biodiversity. We need to be able to connect with people directly who may hold more knowledge than we assume that they do. So really thinking about bi-directional learning. For meeting people where they're at, um, again, the idea of bi-directional learning where there could be, through school meals, educational opportunities for families and parents, but we could also learn from families and parents directly about how to influence and change our own school feeding policies. Thinking about, uh, again, meeting people where they're at. How about access for people experiencing homelessness and meeting them directly where they are at? So instead of asking them to come to a central area, we heard about an example where the program actually came to them where they are actually um, currently settled outside of formal housing. And when we think about uh, even tailoring feeding programs, whether for children or adults, the impact that it could have on reducing waste as well. So thinking about planning around meeting the desires, tastes, and needs of the communities you are working with. And for sure, self-determination for those who have been historically oppressed, wherever you are in the world is not one dimensional. It is not a right that government officials bestow on others, but rather a right that's inherent in everyone's existence that city governments and related organizations must support and help manifest. So the action here is building authentic relationships. And this takes time and intentional effort. So I'll end there. Thank you. I'm super sorry that the nature of this process means that time is not on our sides, but everybody, that was a masterclass in systems leadership. Number one, meet people where they really are. Can't do anything if we don't do that. And most of us who've learnt what that means in practice realise how incredibly difficult it is to do, especially if you come from an elitist segment of society like I do. Number two, co-design. But co-design with the people who need to be there. Don't assume you know who should be on the co-design teams. You need to ask around and, and you will be surprised. I thank you for that. And thirdly, everyone has a right. Nobody has to have their right bestowed on them by anybody. It's there, it's innate, it's in the right to food, it's in the whole human rights framework. Thank you. Really powerful lessons from your work in New Haven. And more. Sorry, that wasn't just your work, it's from your group. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now to Shalene, if, if it is you, Shalene, if you'd like to report back from uh, theme six on building resilience to shocks and stressors, that'd be great. If not, tell us who's going to report back. Yes, Three it's me, um, Shalene. Nice to see everybody. Hello, Shalene. Uh, and uh, over to you. Okay, great. Um, you asked about uh, our emotions, and I'd say that when I entered the room, I think that the striking thing is that there's a lot of deep thinking now um, about how we respond to emergency um, and emergency situations because of what we've been through. But that's also um, deepening thinking about um, developing emergency food plans as a longer term strategy um, food system strategy um, for urban settings. Um, so cities and national governments have certainly played a strong role, um, but uh, we discussed how we need to unlock the potential of the social contract 
and make visible the role that the community plays and how it can take ownership of the response too. So a couple of cities highlighted how um, the city authorities themselves commissioned um, uh, social, the social sector, the third sector or voluntary sector, um, to deliver emergency food plans. And that has led to a stronger sen sense of community um, involvement in the programs. The role that schools and public sector institutions play was also highlighted um, as guarantee, to guarantee vulnerable to guarantee that vulnerable families can continue to receive nourishing meals and ensure healthier, sustainable procurement processes, even when, for example, schools are not open. Um, and one of the participants noted that schools have the opportunity to connect to local producers and local procurement, as mentioned by Bettina, also can be a very important and useful tool to connect the markets that are impacted to um, to, to schools and other, other community settings. We also discussed how building capacities of people and institutions is absolutely key um, to building resilience. And um, different institutions and different stakeholders are composed of different capacities and can support a response, a more effective response to early warning systems. Um, and for some of us, we're facing a number of shocks and stresses and colliding um, shocks and stresses. And this requires um, a more holistic approach to um, dealing with um, emergency situations. A colleague from Sri Lanka gave an example of how flooding takes place nearly every other year and that, that um, different capacities are required to deal with that, but it almost feels like we're starting from scratch each time um, planning is in the framework of the political period and this lasts for just four years I mean and we have to review this every four years so it's really difficult to make sure that our response is sustained and evolving. The role that national government, local government, community food organizations and private sector um, play is varied obviously but we need to consider more how alternative supply chains are set up. There's a shift towards um, the role that entrepreneurs and small businesses can play, and newer supply chains will take place of the old supply chains. Um, I think oh, I'm going to uh, I just heard your bell, David. <laughs> I'm ending. I'm sorry I have to use my cell phone like this. It's just we have completely run out of time, and yet it's so interesting. Thank you, as always, Shalene. Everybody, uh, because I have to give a shout out to this person. Her leadership in really taking forward city dialogues uh, as a result of um, uh, the, work, the work that she's been doing uh, in the last year or so, really fabulous. Just wanted to say it, Shalene. Brilliant. Uh, now let's go to. Uh, the second of the groups working on um, building resilience to shocks and stresses, Alison Blay Palmer, please. You have the floor now, Alison. Thank you, Shalene. Thank you, David. And thank you, Shalene, for introducing um, our conversation because we had many of the same um, issues come up. Our group was really passionate and it was a lot more... Um, I, our conversation raged much more broadly than I would have expected. And we touched on things like um, migration and how migration is providing opportunities that were unexpected coming out of the tragedy that we're all um, living through or um, at the moment in the form of the, the pandemic and how this has lessons for us moving forward and how the crisis has actually given us an opportunity to test our food systems and learn for the future. And in that spirit, some of the things uh, similar to the, um, the suggestions that Shalene had are around building more conduits between really rural, peri-urban and urban spaces uh, as an opportunity for connecting the people who produce the food across the food system with the people who eat the food and 
building more understanding and capacity. And capacity means things like infrastructure, but it also means um, things like educating people about what food is and where it comes from and how hard it is to grow food. And the opportunity for community gardens in cities, for example, to be places of education, activity, community building. Uh, this point was also raised by our group. Um, we also talked about uh, the need for effective partnerships and networks. And I think networks were really something that emerged as being um, important at many levels uh, at the governance scale, but also in terms of building community and building food systems and building not value change, but values chains so that we can make a different food system. And I think really my takeaway from the whole thick conversation was very much more positive and energizing for me than what I was expecting to have happen. And um, that this food system summit is giving us a chance to talk about the opportunities and to build a different food system. And I think that connecting um, and, and developing a territorial approach, which has been a, a common theme throughout um, this, this dialogue, but also building those networks um, and building different food systems that allow the local to thrive, that allow local people to be more self-reliant. Self-reliant was a word that came up quite a few times in our, in our discussion that really um, took me by surprise, but I was really heartened to hear actually. Um, one of the things that came up, it was also a caution not to let governments, local and national governments off the hook in terms of turning emergency responses into <laughs> into permanent solutions but basically it was very positive energizing and um, there's lots of great things we can do by bringing together people building partnerships and resilience once again allison thanks, i'm David. sorry That's thanks okay. to the thanks to the interpreters you've helped us uh, we've still got one more group to go my summary will be really short everything's being said by these wonderful facilitators um, I'd now like to see whether Serge uh, Al Alou uh, is here to give us a uh, report back on the, the group that's looking at the recognition, support uh, and integration that can happen on food through local government efforts. Serge, you have the floor now. Three minutes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, uh, I was supposed to moderate a debate in French. Finally, we have people from uh, Montevideo, Lilongwe, Ghana, um, uh, Bangladesh. So, I mean, we did it in English, in, in Spanish, in French. But if you don't mind, I will report back in French. <laughs> uh, oui, c'est bon, mais on n'a pas beaucoup de temps. Deux oh, minutes, s'il vous plaît. Minutes. Trois minutes. Uh, Deux, merci. Deux minutes. Uh, oui. Je... je Je, je vais dire ce qui importait aux participants. Donc, ce qui importait aux participants, c'était d'abord le besoin de stratégie, euh, le besoin de définir des stratégies euh, au niveau local. Euh, et pour pouvoir définir des stratégies au niveau local, il y avait un certain nombre de conditions à remplir. D'une part, il, il fallait reconstruire un récit euh, pour un narrative, euh, pour euh, euh, montrer l'importance euh, euh, de, euh, de ces... Euh, euh, de la question de l'alimentation au niveau local. Donc, on avait besoin d'un récit et d'un nouveau récit et il faut le construire. Pour pouvoir construire ce récit, il faut des données. Donc, à nouveau, les gens ont insisté sur le besoin de comprendre les situations et d'avoir de l'information sur les situations, donc de pouvoir avoir un package de données qui nous permettent de bâtir ce récit. Et il faut aussi des compétences. Euh, et, et, et ce qui était noté, c'était effectivement dans un certain nombre de cas un défaut de compétences au niveau local euh, pour pouvoir bâtir ces stratégies et agir. Ces stratégies, euh, elles doivent être euh, pluripartenariales, bien sûr, comme on l'a dit euh, euh, souvent, mais deux choses étaient importantes, deux choses ont été soulignées. D'une part, l'engagement des communautés euh, comme étant un point extrêmement important. Donc, la participation communautaire comme étant un des éléments clés pour bâtir ces stratégies. Et deuxièmement, ces stratégies euh, devaient intégrer une approche territoriale, ne pas simplement penser au niveau de la ville, mais penser au niveau de la ville euh, et de son euh, environnement rural et d'avoir euh, euh, de réfléchir à un, à un développement équilibré euh, où la ville et euh, le rural euh, ont chacun leur place. Euh, 
Et enfin, euh, euh, on a eu un moment de débat sur le rôle euh, des gouvernements centraux euh, et sur l'importance qu'avaient les gouvernements centraux dans un rôle de facilitation, de régulation et de mise en place des conditions pour assurer l'investissement nécessaire au niveau des infrastructures, au niveau local, euh, pour pouvoir agir. J'ai terminé. Thank you very much, Serge. That was absolutely great. And look, everybody, we've now heard from all the rapporteurs. Can I just check? Have I left anybody out? It would be so embarrassing. Okay. And some of you uh, really were rushed by me. I apologize. Apologize like anything. Costas Tamoulis, come in for 30 seconds. You are the big, uh, you've been so important behind this. I need to hear from you. Costas, please. Um, I think I, I learned a lot, at least uh, from the whole discussion and from people that are practicing it. I just want to make one cautionary note. No, a lot of good things were heard, but one has to prioritize depending on the capacities of urban and local governments to bring out such a challenging agenda. So my example would be that if you have tons of money, that's not the primary, um, that's not the, the primary demand. The, the primary issue is to build the capacity of local administrations to handle and coordinate such a big agenda. So, and to have the ability to spend that kind of money. So in some cases, Though they are ready to run. In some cases, we have to work with them to make sure yeah. they work. That's all they okay. do. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody who's participated, this has been super rich and extremely important. I offer you seven points in my summary, uh, and uh, I will try to be uh, a little bit slow. I've got three minutes. Number one. This needs deep thought, deep strategic thought. Let's think about it carefully and not just sail in imagining it's easy. There's been a lot of focus on, under this heading, a lot of focus on capabilities and competencies. Costas just brought it up, but it's come through from several of you. There's been a lot on engaging communities. And right at the center of this is self-reliance and agency. So the deep strategic thought has to be about encouraging really competent action at the local level. And several of you mentioned, think in terms of the territoire, think in terms of the governance space and link together the urban and the rural, don't get, don't fall into that uh, our trap of somehow separating urban from rural. So that's my summary area one, deep strategic thought. And I think we can identify the areas where that thought is needed. Second, systems leadership. It's never going to be done through linear patterns of leadership. It's leadership where you bring together groups who are involved in multiple processes, helping them to connect and co-create, but unusually. And then we had a, a, a suggestion for how you get the right people there. You include them, you inform them, you integrate them, and you in, work through institutions. All those matter. And meet people where they really are. Don't meet people where you think they want to be. And all those qualities of systems leadership are absolutely critical and there is more to be added in. Very happy for anybody to contact me if you want to go into that in more detail. Number three, four English letters beginning with P. If we're working in urban, we're focusing on the place, the place where different groups of people come together. It's all about place. And it's all about people because the people have to come together in that place. But these people have complex relationships with each other 
and it's important to understand the power relationships between which, which mean, as you've many of you have said, we must get into the politics. But I think there's a fourth P ingredient that matters, and that's passion. We can do a lot within political context if we let our passion come in. That's not passion where you come in and tell everybody else how rubbish they are. This is the passion that values the energy that comes from getting people to work together. So hold on to those four Ps. Place, people, politics and passion. My fourth point. There's real value in drawing on the energy of local non-governmental organizations, civil society in its different forms, maybe religious groups, sports groups, professional groups, theme groups, uh, political groups. That's great, but make sure that it is empowering NGO energy. You've all brought that out. The NGOs are key, but we need them to empower local actors. Point five, there are some key parts to this. And, and uh, you, you identified one of them, and that was that you can do such a lot in the context of the school. Or going further, you can do such a lot in working with young children and their teachers and the parents and taken together, it's a whole ecosystem, and focus on nutrition, health and well-being of school children, Obviously, meals is part of it, but there's a lot more exercise, uh, general approaches to dealing with life, general ways of relating to each other. All of you have got experience, but we had lovely examples, particularly, I thought, from the group that was looking at procurements, or the groups that were looking at procurement. Thank you. Number six, we don't do it by individuals. We do it through champions. But we don't do it even by individual champions, we do it through networks of champions. Networks that can expand and expand and expand and expand. So you get working with one city and then networks go to other cities and then smaller towns. But get those networks going and let it spread through networks. So that, as you've said, it was beautiful. Not value chains, but chains of values. Wonderful. And then lastly, my seventh point. Governance is at the heart of all this. Uh, because in the end, unless there is governance, there's no way of coping with the impact of power differentials that often lead to those with less power being marginalised or even uh, having bad stuff done. So let's get the governance part in there. But let's be positive and see governance a positive, empowering activity Never let ourselves get trapped into presenting and visualising governance as somehow restrictive and uh, taking away energy. So I put down here, place, people, politics, passion and positivity about the real potential of well-governed food systems in urban, uh, urban contexts. Juan Echenovi from Action Track 4 has put some material in here on Action Track 4, 3, localizing food systems, promoting sustainable urban and territorial development. Take that and run with it. Everybody do your independent dialogues, but most important, let this food summit be a launch pad for absolutely transformative action on food everywhere for the benefits of all and let it happen through the urban areas. To the team from FAO, the team from C40, the team from ICLEI, all of the facilitators, all of the wonderful, brilliant interpreters, the people behind the scenes that held this all together, and particularly to the colleagues who did all the hard work, and special, special, special thanks to Kayo Taken Oshita, who is well, absolute dynamo at the heart of this, together with others. I'd like to thank Sarah Hutton as well for her work and many, many other people whose names I perhaps don't have at the top of my mind. I've run out of time, but I've not run out of the energy that comes from this dialogue and my wish to wrap my arms around you all and say, run with it. This will be a vital strand 
of the transformation to come. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Stick with it through this summit and beyond. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.